Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for having Platform 9 here. It's great. it's great for us to be here and for us to be able to share our story. I'd like to go and first talk about the people at Platform 9 and what we do and why we do what we do. And um, my name is Suresh Raghuram. I'm the co-founder and CEO. And I've had the luxury of starting Platform 9 with uh, three of my closest colleagues over the years. Uh, the four of us, uh, starting with Bick Lee, uh, was engineer number 18 at VMware, going back to 1998. Um, we left uh, in 2013 to start Platform 9. And you'll be learning more about why we started Platform 9 and what's the soul behind the company. Uh, Rupak Parikh leads engineering. Madhura Maskaski is here. Uh, she leads uh, product. And uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO. We've also had the luxury of having some really smart people uh, along with us in this mission. And uh, people who've come from VMware, Microsoft, Cisco, graduates from Stanford, Berkeley, great people. And I'm really excited with the team that we have. We are based in Sunnyvale in California. So it's a little bit warmer over there. But we recently opened, because it's too warm over there, we recently opened a second R&D center in Salt Lake City. And uh, we're going to be growing in both locations. We're backed Series A funded by Redpoint Ventures. And uh, we have some great advisors on board. Bogomil Balkansky ran product marketing at VMware till he left in 2013. And Hans Robertson was also early at VMware in the early part of the last decade. But he's more well known for having started Meraki. And you will see the analogy between Meraki and Platform 9 in a little bit. Carolyn McCrory was another ex-VMware uh, advisor that we have. Uh, she worked in the field extensively and brings us valuable customer inputs from the field. So where are we today? Uh, we were started in 2013. Uh, we launched out of Stealth in August. And we've had a very successful beta for KVM. We've had customers use us with infrastructure that's spread across the oceans with thousands of virtual machine deployments every single day. And the service has held up flawlessly through eight updates uh, since we first started the beta program. So we're very excited about the beta. And uh, we're looking forward to where it goes from here. I'd like to talk about how Platform 9 got started. Uh, this was uh, before we started Platform 9. The, I was pulled into a meeting in San Francisco uh, by a friend of mine. And they were a startup that had grown to 400 people. Uh, they were having challenges with Amazon Web Services. They were using Web Services, AWS. It was great for them till they, they got to that scale. But they were now unhappy with the performance and the value that they were perceiving for the kind of money that they were spending. And they were looking for alternatives. And th this was a really smart team, really great IT and ops skills, very familiar with Linux, co-location, hardware management. And I asked them the question, well, why don't you build a private cloud? And the, the person looked at me like I was crazy. And I was like, wait, what am I missing? Uh, it's like, no, you can't do a private cloud. I need like 25 people to run a private cloud. And that you know, shook things up for us. I'd been in VMware for 12 years as an engineer. And to hear someone say that all this fantastic infrastructure software, uh, ESX, virtualization, hardware utilization, vMotion, storage vMotion, all these features, you're saying you can't use it because you think it's too hard? And I said, yeah, it's too hard. So there was a lot of soul searching from that. And we had other conversations as well. And we started Platform 9 to make private clouds really simple and really easy for any organization at any scale. That is the soul of what we do. We want private clouds to be useful, be easy, operationally efficient. And we don't want people shying away from private clouds, even though they think it's a better option, because they think it's just too hard. And what does this mean? So we mean we are talking about, you know, there's a, a big spectrum of organizations that are out there. And who are we, who are we right for? We, we think that we architected for a wide range of organizations, but we think there's a sweet spot. Uh, organizations that are large enough to have something like 50 physical servers, and have several thousand physical servers, up to 5,000. Our largest customer is going to be at 5,000 physical servers next year. That is a sweet spot where we think they need a lot of help. They don't often have the experience and the skills to execute on this. That's who we help. Let's define private clouds a little bit, because clouds mean different things to different people. Everybody has their own definition for private cloud. What do we mean by private cloud? We think that a private cloud very simply enables 
efficient self-service access to the development community within organizations of the computing resources that exist within the organization while satisfying IT and operations policies. Okay? Self-service, existing infrastructure, IT ops policies. Why is this important? Well, you know, if you step back and look at the history of computing, there were three really major shifts. It comes down to two words, development productivity. So look at time sharing in the mid-1960s when mainframes supported time sharing, brought about development productivity. Look at personal computers and the fact that any software developer in his basement could have a computer to work on, development productivity. Look at the public cloud and what it has done seven or eight years ago, development productivity. And the irony is, most of the world's computing resources exists in organizations today. Not in the public cloud, but in organizations today. And most of that is not efficiently available to the development teams within those organizations. So it's about development productivity. That's what private clouds enable. What do we mean by that? We mean that you know, virtualization has been fantastic at being a really, really enabling technology for operations, flexibility, vMotion, the ability to, to decouple your application from your infrastructure, physical infrastructure, means that you get a lot of flexibility in your operations. What, had, what does it mean to developers? If they still have to file tickets to get things done, and they have to wait on those tickets for some stra overloaded IT person to be able to get to, how has this improved their lives? Right? So we think that there's a few missing components to complete the picture. We think virtualization is the foundation, but it is, private cloud is not just a virtualized environment. You need to have resource pooling at scale. It's not a cluster we're talking about. We're talking about an organization's infrastructure being pooled into a private cloud. We, you then need to be able to orchestrate applications, place workloads intelligently onto that pool of infrastructure. So you need to have placement intelligence, placement automation. You need to have self-service, a way to onboard end users, have, give them quotas and leases and policies that satisfy operations requirements. And you need to have orchestration for application stacks to be constructed to enable DevOps use cases. That's about it. So virtualization is absolutely the underpinning, but you do need to have a really simple and easy way to have these key capabilities to be able to say that you're not just a virtualized environment, you have a private cloud. And why, why bother with private clouds? Well, you know, there's a few reasons. You already have in-house infrastructure. It already exists. The majority of the world's infrastructure today exists in-house, and it gives you control. Choose the hardware that you want. Choose the servers that you want, the storage, the networks, you have flexibility, you have control, you choose what lives where, right? And finally, there is a point about economics. There is a myth out there that public clouds are somehow magically cheaper. As someone who uses Amazon Web Services myself, let me tell you, at scale, it is very expensive, okay? Most elite technology companies do not use the public cloud beyond a certain bootstrap point. Why is that? Because hardware is cheap. You know, there's a rule of thumb out there, six months of hardware spending, uh, Amazon spending buys you the hardware. Co-location is efficient. There's large data center providers that are really efficient at co-locating your infrastructure, making it easy for you to have your infrastructure hosted. The unsolved problem is how do you manage all of these resources as a cloud of infrastructure? That, unfortunately, today is still an unsolved problem, and that is why we started Platform Line. So if you were going to go and build a, pri a private cloud, what would it look like? How, how should a private cloud be built three years from now? How should it be architected? We think that it should be agnostic to the underlying virtualization platform. We think that ESX is one of the greatest pieces of software ever written. Having said that, there are alternatives today that are almost good enough. And for a lot of workloads, they may offer a better cost option uh, that, that works better for organizations. So KVM and Hyper-V are examples, depending on whether you're a Linux-centric customer or a Windows-centric customer. Uh, containers will be far more common. Again, containers bring about incrementally better development productivity. They're lightweight. They have a very elegant workflow that integrates with developers' lives. So they will succeed. They will become more common. And the question is, your, your private cloud has to be able to leverage and give you freedom of choice. right? Use the technologies that you want. And your private cloud, like an operating system, has to be able to support multiple runtimes. So if you then think about how you would go about architecting such a private cloud, you could go down the VMware vCloud route, uh, which is great if you're a pure VMware ESX environment. Uh, but 
You could go down the Docker route, which is again great if you're a pure Docker environment. But there is an open source project out there. It is the second largest open source project of all time. Uh, it's OpenStack. It's agnostic to any of these underlying virtualization platforms. And it has a lot of leverage from the community. So we think that OpenStack makes sense for that reason. And this is you know, borne out. These are Google search, uh, Google Trends uh, results for search interest in uh, management products from VMware versus uh, OpenStack. And I don't think that you should draw any conclusions from the absolute numbers, but I think the trend lines are, uh, can, can be used to draw conclusions. And what you can say is there is growing interest uh, from the user community in OpenStack for a lot of the same reasons that I've outlined. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the OpenStack architecture, but I just want to introduce it. OpenStack, at its core, is a collection of distributed services, uh, REST APIs, communicating over message queues. It's a service-oriented architecture inspired by Amazon. And at its core, it has Nova, which is, it was the original mothership, brings together the compute and storage and network with a placement engine that's called the scheduler. There's Glance, which serves as an image library. Neutron, which enables OpenStack to work with a network plane of your choice, right? Be it software-defined networks or traditional networks. And Cinder, which integrates with block storage devices of your choice. So it could be storage that you already have, could be software-defined storage solutions you're looking at, doesn't matter. So, and it works, all of this works independent of what the underlying virtualization technology is, okay? So there's a lot of advantages to that. You know, at its core, the design is a fundamentally sound one. It's loosely coupled. It's inspired by Amazon, which is a good thing. Amazon's been great, right? So you should, you should be influencing uh, based on Amazon's design. It's got fantastic REST APIs. If you're, if you're comparing OpenStack APIs with something like WeCloud, I think you'll find that an increasing number of developers will be more comfortable with the REST APIs that OpenStack exposes, which is, again, very similar to the APIs that Amazon Web Services exposes. Uh, it's open source, so open source products have a way of keeping vendors honest, and I think it's important. It's ultimately great for customers. There's leverage from a huge community. So if you buy a storage device tomorrow, or you buy a network plane tomorrow, you know that it's going to work well with an OpenStack system. That matters, right? So there's great reasons, and finally, the most important point is that it's, it's independent of your virtualization platform. So there's a lot of advantages to OpenStack. So why don't you see everyone running an OpenStack cloud at scale successfully? Uh, we think there's a few reasons why. We think that it's a framework. I think there's, you know, this is debatable, but there are people who come around to this view that OpenStack is a fantastic framework, but it isn't quite at the level where it's a finished product that people can just get up and running with. So, and there's a glib quote out there which says, you know, if you have a lot of money, use VMware. If you have a lot of time, use OpenStack. I think that's a little facetious, but the point is the TCO is a little unproven. Um, it's not clear. It depends to a large extent on your organization's skills. If you have OpenStack ninjas in-house, yeah, I think your TCO will be great. If you don't, I think there's a good chance your TCO will be worse than what you have. It only supports greenfield environments, so it does not support Anything that you guys are using today, it doesn't work with. You need to set up a new greenfield environment to, to be able to use it with OpenStack. Upgrades are very challenging. Uh, depending on what OpenStack solution you're using, it can be very difficult to upgrade OpenStack from one release to another. And those releases themselves are very rapidly evolving, so it changes very quickly. So let's, let's use that prelude to talk about deployment models. And the, the traditional deployment model for OpenStack has been an on-premise distribution where someone in IT has to go and download and install and configure and monitor and troubleshoot and backup an OpenStack installation. And there's a couple of advantages to that. You can use it to work with your existing infrastructure. You have full control. If you are an OpenStack ninja, you can customize it and have it do exactly what you want. But there's a few downsides, right? Which is the biggest one being this takes a lot of skill, and most organizations either do not have the skill or do not have the time. Even if they have the skill, they, their teams are spread so thin that this is not something they want to spend their time on. So all of that ultimately leads to the costs, and this may not be a great option depending on your, the profile of your organization. The other alternative is a hosted private OpenStack cloud. And this is where there's a third-party provider, a service provider, that is running infrastructure for you, 
but having it managed by OpenStack, so they deploy OpenStack, they manage it, they configure it, they tune it, they take care of the SLA, which is great. It gives you the convenience, it gives you the flexibility to say, look, we can get up and running and we don't have to spend our time uh, or we don't need to have the skill to manage OpenStack. But ultimately, you are using external infrastructure, which means that you lose some of the advantages with the other model, which is you, have, you can't use your existing infrastructure, your data lives outside, and the costs, depending on the provider that you choose, might be worse than using a public cloud. If you compare this, I think you should compare this with Amazon VPC, and it's not clear that this is actually going to be all strictly better. It depends. It's variable. So both of these models have their challenges. And the question we asked ourselves at Platform 9 is, is there a way to get the best of both? Is there a way by which we can give you the control of your existing infrastructure, the customizability, the economics of a model that works with your infrastructure, with the convenience and the ease of use and the, the predictability of the, the hosted private cloud model where you are ultimately not having to struggle with managing OpenStack itself, and you have someone who's going to help you manage your cloud with a predictable SLA. And that is how we came to Platform 9's approach.